With Pastor Teacher Harry Reader, this is In Perspective. It's really interesting, this relationship between Nathan and King David. We have a prophet called of God who is not perfect, and it becomes abundantly clear that he is not perfect, but he is committed, and he is pliable. He is teachable. He is surrendered as a preacher, an advisor, an author, a counselor, and as a leader himself, as he works in the life of King David, the leader. Welcome, and stay with us as Harry Reader applies the scriptures to the everyday events of life that we might begin to view our existence from God's eternal perspective, that we might view all of life from a biblical perspective. Today, Harry brings us part one of the message, portrait number two, Nathan, as we continue our series, Biblical Biographies, Who, Why, How. Nathan was not only a prophet preacher, but a prophet pastor, and prophet advisor who played a valuable role in the life of King David. As God worked in David's life through Nathan, he was also working in Nathan's life at the same time. Nathan was a prophet called by God who was not perfect, but is shown to be committed, pliable, teachable, and surrendered as an advisor, counselor, and teacher as he served King David. If you're following along in the scriptures, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're focusing on verses 4 through 17. Let's rejoin Pastor Teacher Harry Reader with part one of the message, Portrait Number 2, Nathan. Look with me, if you would, in your copy of God's Word, the 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now I'm going to be reading not a whole lot of scripture, but some scripture, three texts, and there's a little bit of length to it in order to gain the information we need to make some distillations and observations out of the biographical study of Nathan the prophet, as he is called in the Bible. And uh, so we are going to take a look at that. Now I'll start with this text and then kind of work us through the other two texts as well. There's, so there's three key texts. It's not exhaustive, but three key texts. Second Samuel chapter 7, and um, slip down to verse 1. Now, by the way, one of the clues that you want to listen pretty carefully to this and try to find out about Nathan's life is uh, Nathan had some pretty direct confrontations with, as you're going to see, uh, David. David a powerful king, a man that could have his life at any time as he had already proven concerning Uriah. And yet Nathan had the courage to be a prophet in his life. What kind of interests me is after he deals with him and he deals with him in Bathsheba and he deals with him and his lack of attention to following out God's line of succession and all of that, but what's interesting is is that David so much appreciated him that one of his sons was named after Nathan with Bathsheba. It's really interesting, this relationship between Nathan and King David. And one of the key moments starts right here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's look at a moment about David. Now, verse 1, now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see... Now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling, and all 
in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly." From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up from your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever." I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever." in accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan then spoke to David. And so God deals with Nathan, and then God deals with David through Nathan. And then if you want to go on further in the study of this text, and you'll find it interesting for our own purposes at another time, perhaps, you can finish out chapter 7. So let's start with Nathan. Where, who is he and where does he come from? So what about his origin? Uh, where does Nathan come from, his origin? Well, let me uh, suggest to you, we don't really know. We don't have enough information about his background to be able to make those statements. But here's what we do know. He has been called, anointed, and ordained as a prophet in Israel. He is not the first, but he is one of the first prophets that come before us, that set before us, the prototype of what prophets are to be in Israel. This is one of the great studies that I had the privilege to do because I knew what was coming in my ordination. One of the questions in my ordination was, name the prophets, name all the kings, name all the dynasties, and tell us what dynasties and kings and kingdoms and what kings each prophet ministered to. And of course, one of the first ones I began with was Nathan, who would minister to King David with an overflow to Solomon. There are three offices in the Old Testament that prefigure and anticipate the Messiah's ministry, the Messiah, the anointed one. The three anointed offices in the Old Testament are prophet, priest, and king. And then one of the things that we are about to find out is that David, who is king, And David, when it comes to king, becomes the premier type of Jesus as king. He is of the tribe of Judah. As the prophecy through Jacob had established that the scepter would not leave Judah, that Judah would be the tribe of the kings. There was the step of Saul from uh, the tribe of Benjamin, but now we find out he has been put aside by the hand of God, and now the fulfillment of God's promise to Judah that the scepter would be placed in that tribe has come through David. And it will continue to David's son Solomon. So as it continues to David's son Solomon, ultimately God's covenant with David is pointing to one that will come through this line of David and Solomon who will be greater than Solomon And this one will be the one who sets up God's covenant with his people forever, establishing a forever kingdom, as you just heard from the text. From your throne, 
Your throne, David, will be established forever. So what happens is, is that Nathan, this prophet, is now serving David. David, of course, has been under assault, and you can follow all of the history of Saul to David to this point as you work through 1 Samuel and as you work through as you work through 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel with focus upon Saul and the rise of David, 2 Samuel with the focus upon David himself. What seems to be abundantly clear is that Nathan is not only a prophet preacher, he is also a prophet pastor. He is also a prophet advisor. He is also a prophet counselor. He is also, and you're going to see this as we work through the three texts, he is also a prophet author. It is David, uh, it is um, these books that bear the oversight of Samuel were originally together, and it seems as if there is much evidence that some of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, significant portions of it, come through Nathan, the prophet. So he is also an author for us. So while we don't know much of his origins, we do know, as he originates before us, we have a prophet called of God who is not perfect, and it becomes abundantly clear that he is not perfect, but he is committed, and he is pliable. He is teachable. He is surrendered as a preacher, an advisor, an author, a counselor, and as a leader himself as he works in the life of, of King David, the leader. And we have these three key texts, this is one of them, and three key events that take place. From that, we begin to understand something not only about his origin, but also his calling as a prophet in these particular roles that he fulfills. Now, what's really interesting here is we see him right out of the chute. Again, if, as I think the evidence shows that Nathan is involved in the composition by the Spirit of God of 2 Samuel. He willingly shows you his warts and pimples. I mean, the first time we're dealing with him, he makes a mistake. It, does not, it is not cast as a sinful mistake. It's one of those, to be human is to err. And he makes one. He loves David. He's been with David to this point. David arrives at this point, and look, and I think this is the way Nathan took it, and I can understand why he would take it. He takes it this way. David says, who am I? Look at this house. I have been in David's house in the Jebusite city of the original Jerusalem before it expanded up to the Temple Mount. I've literally been in this house, and to not to get too graphic, I have actually seen David's toilet that has been examined and has been documented back to the days of David because of some leftover materials in that toilet. And I'll go no further in explanation. And uh, so you're able to see his toilet in the David's palace, which is down below the Temple Mount. David now sees what he has and where he is, and God's given him victory. I want to build a house for the Lord. That's what I want to do. I want to build a temple for the Lord. You can almost hear him probably talk about some of the materials that will later be referenced in when my reading of the text for you in that moment, which was cedar, a house of cedar. I want the cedars of Lebanon to be there, and that's exactly what one day will end up there. And then when David, I don't know whether it's a formal meeting or an informal meeting, but he tells that to David, Nathan and says, Nathan says, go for it. Go do what you want to do. Sounds great to me. And so I don't think he's just rubber stamping or anything. I think he hears David. He hears David's heart. He says, you know, why shouldn't God have a place? The Ark of the Covenant has never rested anywhere but in a tent. And the Holy of Holies has never been anywhere but in the tent of meeting. Let's have a place that's worthy of our God or at least make some worthy statement about our God. David, do it. Well, then God doesn't go to David. He goes to the prophet. 
Because God works through the preaching of his word. Now, please remember, when we use the word prophet and prophecy in the Bible, prophet is the office, prophecy is the act. Prophecy means to speak truth, speak forth truth. Sometime that is foretelling of truth. Sometimes it's forthtelling. And the prophet ministry is a predecessor to the preaching ministry of the New Testament, prophets and teachers at Antioch, meaning the same thing as preachers and teachers. Now, once the first century is done, and through the apostles, you have the canonization of Scripture, any foretelling is done because the scripture is complete and the last living apostle is instructed. Let no man add or subtract to the words of this book. And so it is finished. So revelation through prophets and apostles has ceased. Through prophets who gave prophecy that is God's revealed truth through them that becomes canonized in the scripture by the inspiration of the spirit. And then later apostles who speak prophetic word giving to us the word of God as it is being revealed to us. Now folks, this is important because we are people of the book. You don't know there's a trinity without the Bible. You know there's a God without the Bible. Because the creation declares the glory of God. But you would never know he dwells as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You would never know his redeeming work to provide a satisfactory atonement on your behalf to save you from your sins without God's revealed word. So we have the Old Testament, which is the New Testament concealed, and then the New Testament, which is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament, as I think it was Augustine who said this, it's like walking in a dimly, it's like walking in a lavish room, dimly lit, stumbling around it, and you know something special. And then when the New Testament comes in Christ, somebody cuts on the light. Oh, it's majesty. Oh, that's what you meant by the ark. That's what you meant by the prophets. That's what you meant by the priest. That's what you meant by the tabernacle. That's what you meant by the temple. That's what you meant by the rainbow. That's what you meant through the sacrificial offerings, the burnt offerings, the thank offerings, the love offering. Oh, it was all coming to Jesus. Now look at the exposition of it. So when the last of the apostles die, then the last of divine canonical revelation has been given. We now have the word of God. Praise God. We have his inspired, infallible, sufficient, inerrant word. Now what we pray is for the Holy Spirit who gave the word of God through the prophets and the apostles as the foundation for us. Now what we pray for is the Holy Spirit to do the work of illumination through the succession of the office of prophet, which is preaching and teaching. And that's not foretelling truth. We already have all that truth. It's forthtelling truth. It's expounding truth. It is proclaiming, preaching the word of God, taking the sacred text that is profitable and bringing the teaching from it, then the application. And that is exactly what Nathan becomes an example to us. Not only does God use him as a forth teller prophet to give us more scripture, but he also is a foreteller. He is a preacher of the word that he has that God has given to him. And what he finds out as a preacher is your last statement in the life of David was wrong. Nathan, if I wanted a house, I would order one. And when I'm ready for a house, I'll order one. And when I decide who will build my house, I will identify him. It is not David's calling. And we'll find out multiple reasons why it's not David's calling. David will not be the one who builds my house. There will be many reasons in his life, in his kingdom, in his kingship, 
and in his family that I will not use him to build my house. But I am going to have a house, but it will not be David. But I am going to make a covenant with David. And my covenant is, is I am giving my kingdom. My kingdom is going to be given to him and through his succession. And I'm going to make his son to be the successor. His son will be the king. And I will give his son. Now that son is not going to be perfect. And I'm going to have to discipline him with enemies from without and with his own people from within. I will have to bring stripes. I will have to bring discipline against him. That's what I'm going to do. But I have given my kingdom to David and to his son. More than that, with David and through his son, I am going to give a king that will establish a, an eternal kingdom, a forever kingdom, a kingdom whose throne has no end, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. And that covenant is what I'm making with David. That's a monumental moment in the history of redemption. What you have in the Bible is when man falls into sin, God begins to unfold the covenant of grace with Adam with a promise. I'm going to give a seed to the woman that will be at enmity with the seed of Satan. He will have his heel bruised, but he will crush the serpent and the seed of the serpent. And then it's unfolded to the covenant with Noah. And then the next step is the covenant with Abraham. And the next step with the covenant to Moses. And now God takes another step in his covenant. And it's the covenant with David, the Davidic covenant. And so he's telling Nathan, here is my covenant with David. I'll give him a king through his son. With his son, I'll build the house. But not with David. That is not what he's called to do. I have, can I say it kind of irreverently? I don't mean to be, but not blasphemously. What he says is, look, I did not need a house to get him out of Egypt. I didn't need a house to get him through the Red Sea. I didn't need a house to get them through the wilderness. I didn't need a house when I appointed judges to shepherd them. And I didn't need a house when I had to deal with the wrong-directed kingship of Saul. And I don't need a house with David. And I don't need David to build the house. I'll tell you who will build my house. But you tell David, he's my king. And his son will be the king. And then will come a forever king through this line. That's what he says to him. And now what I love is the way the scripture deals with this. Nathan doesn't have an argument with God. You can almost see it. Oh, think I was wrong. So what does Nathan do? He's a good preacher. He, he acknowledges my first proclamation to you, David. It might have been well-meaning, well-hearted, but it was wrong-headed. So I was wrong. Here's what God just revealed to me in this vision. Here is the covenant God is making with you. And he goes back to David and he corrects himself. Well, I have to say to you, I know this probably doesn't mean as much to you as it does to me, but there was a reason why I've made a promise I would never write anything that gets published until I was 40. I didn't want to embalm anything with print and ink. I had enough things I had to go back and ask forgiveness for and change rather than to embalm some and then have somebody have to go buy the books and burn them somewhere. Nathan got it wrong. And while we're not given any details, he repented. Now, there's no sense that Nathan got it wrong because of a sinful rebellion against God. It was just a thoughtless pronouncement in the name of God as a prophet that was wrong. And when God corrected him, he made the correction. And he was not fearful to go back to David and said, I mean, can you imagine going back and saying, well, David, I was wrong. You were said you're going to build this house for God. And I said, do it. If it's in your heart, go do it. Well, this is what God revealed to me. And here's the covenant he's going to make with you. And in that covenant, he's not going to, he says he doesn't need your house. And he's not going to let you build that house. But he is going to bless your seed. 
and he is good through your son going to establish this kingdom. And so he comes back and he does that. What do you see immediately in this prophet? Humility. But you also see boldness with conviction. When God tells me something and corrects me, not only was he humble enough to change and repent, but he's bold enough and with conviction that once I got God's word, I'm going to go back and tell David what he needs to hear. Then you also see him changing from a thoughtless response to now guided by God's word as a preacher and prophet. He now gives wisdom and insight to David. Nathan was a prophet called by God who was not perfect, but is shown to be committed, pliable, teachable, and surrendered as an advisor, counselor, and teacher as he served King David. Join us again next time as we continue with our series, Biblical Biographies, Who, Why, How. Now, if you would like to receive an audio copy of the entire message from which today's In Perspective was taken, Write and request portrait number two, Nathan, or simply ask for message number 15066. Again, that's message number 15066. We do request $5 when you request today's CD. Address your request to In Perspective, 2200 Briarwood Way, Birmingham, Alabama 35243. If someone came up to you and said, I know you're a Christian, but tell me, explain to me exactly what is it that you believe? Now, most of us could say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He's my Savior. But what else do you believe? Pastor teacher Harry Reeder says of the Apostles' Creed, it is a gift of God's providence to His church, containing essential foundations of the faith once for all delivered to the saints as an instrument of discipleship, confession, and unity. In a nutshell, it summarizes in three concise sentences what the Christian believes. Harry has developed an in-depth 20-part series on the Apostles' Creed that every believer ought to have as a part of their personal study. Know the Apostles' Creed and you will always be able to share what you believe. You can obtain the entire series by going to briarwood.org forward slash Apostles Creed CD. Again, that's briarwood.org forward slash Apostles Creed CD. We hope that In Perspective is encouraging you in your walk with Christ. We would love to hear back from you. Write Harry at In Perspective. 2200 Briarwood Way, Birmingham, Alabama 35243, or email inperspective at briarwood.org. Join us again next time as Harry Reader takes us back into the scriptures so that we might learn to put life in biblical perspective.